Okay, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the webinar. Thanks to everybody for joining. Uh, we try and keep these webinars brief to respect everybody's time, so a, a, a tight 30 minutes, so we're going to get right into it. Uh, today we're talking about remote offices and remote locations and performance monitoring into them. These days remote office can mean a lot of things, so I wanted to start out with a definition. We consider it any company location that doesn't have its own data center and it connects to a data center over a network. So that could be LAN, WAN, internet. It's anywhere IT isn't that IT still needs to see and support. And so that might be uh, retail stores, hospitals, doctor's offices, banks, hotels, or any branch office or home office. But before we begin, Let's, uh, let's do some introductions. Uh, my name is Damien Roskill. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Abneta, and I'm joined by Alec from our Product Marketing Team. And we've also got Christine helping us out with the webinar logistics and queuing up your questions. Uh, in terms of an agenda, here's what we're going to be covering. I'm going to start first by talking about what I call the remote office challenge, and then we'll move into some specific examples of what you're missing when you can't see into these remote offices. Then I'm going to switch it over to Alec, who's going to walk through some remote monitoring best practices. And then finally, we'll finish up with some examples for how Epneta can help. Before we begin, some logistics. Got to do the logistics. So today's webinar is being recorded, as always. And the webinar uh, recording will be sent out to everybody who signed up. So if you have to leave early or you miss a portion of it. Um, don't worry, we'll, we'll send it out and make it available to you. If you have questions, feel free to ask us questions anytime during the presentation. Don't necessarily wait till the end. We're happy to interrupt um, what we're talking about to answer questions as people think about them. If you're having difficulties, best thing I can do is tell you to try a different browser. Oh, and I also wanted to mention that all our past webinars are up on our website. So if there's, you know, we've got lots of other webinars that cover a lot of other subjects. Uh, make sure to go and uh, investigate those. They're, we've got some pretty interesting stuff. So let's start with what I call the remote office puzzle. As an IT professional, I'm responsible for supporting users in remote locations. But I'm not there. And I may not have the, any ability to get there without an expensive truck roll or hopping on a plane. So how do I see what I need to see? How do I solve a problem when I'm not there? And if I'm really good, how do I do this proactively rather than reactively? Well, one trend we've been seeing here at Upneta is the growth in the number of companies that are spinning up remote locations, creating a geographically distributed enterprise. There are lots of reasons why organizations are becoming more distributed. Remote locations can bring many benefits to a company. The simplest reason is because they're expanding. They've added locations and their business does a lot of business in that particular loca locale. But they're also put online because it can give that company access to highly specialized talent pools across technology, product, product development, or sales. And companies that acquire other companies often end up with multiple offices. And of course, if your company is international, well, then you're used to dealing with these issues already. Application infrastructure is more distributed as well. Many companies have existing data centers and are now moving applications to the cloud, whether it's via AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud. And then they're also aggressively adopting, adopting numerous SaaS and cloud-based services from Office 365 to Zenefits. And as these organizations scale out the number of locations, they're no longer thinking MPLS and backhauling data through a central data center. Instead, they're deploying public ISPs like Comcast and Verizon. And then they're adding VPNs on top of them and creating resiliency via technologies like SD-WAN. So these remote locations are now accessing applications that are distributed between the traditional data center and then connecting directly to a wide variety of SaaS providers rather than going through a backhaul. And then finally, the SaaS application providers themselves are also distributing their applications. When you access Office 365 or G Suite from two different locations, chances are you're accessing that application from two different localized clouds. And that means when the user calls you up and says he or she can't access the application, it's not enough for you to check whether it's just working for you because you could be accessing completely different infrastructure. 
If the old answer of it's up for me was empty before, it's even more empty now. And all this leads to a lack of visibility to the end user experience of users in those remote locations. And traditional monitoring tools just can't help. And why is that? Well, traditional monitoring, network monitoring tools rely on having access to devices. Think routers, switches, in order to assess performance. But when you move applications to the cloud and then connect them over the public internet, you no longer have access to that data. The general complexity and lack of visibility into these various networks has introduced a big management challenge for IT teams who have to make sure every user can get what they need without slowdowns or outages. And yet IT and network ops teams are still responsible for performance. And when, you're, when a user in a remote location can't access G Suite, he or she isn't calling Google, they're calling you. And if IT and network ops teams sort of more broadly want to be a part of the movement to the cloud, they need to demonstrate that they can manage this new cloud infrastructure. So this is both an issue and an opportunity for these teams. This lack of visibility into remote locations is, is probably the single biggest issue for IT around remote locations. And there are many important details you don't see when you're not in the same place as your, the users you're supporting. These will all become important when you hear complaints from the users about their experience with their applications. And without the right information, it will be hard to find and fix the problem. It'll also be hard to hold providers and ISPs to account if you can't pinpoint the problem to their network. You'll end up in an endless loop of finger pointing. And when it comes to remote locations, there's a bunch of information which is essential when troubleshooting. You need to be able to quickly separate the application and network issues and understand how many people are affected. Ghost issues can be the most challenging in my experience. How many IT pros get a call from a user having an issue with an application where they say, I can't access the application? And they say, oh, never mind, it's working now. And then they just hang up, leaving you to guess whether the pro where the problem was and whether or not it's a larger systemic issue or just a one-off problem. And even worse is when the user calls up and says, I had an issue yesterday. But of course, they didn't file a ticket. How can you actually look back in time to understand what happened? With the rise of cloud, SLA compliance is becoming more and more important for organizations. The call center accessing a SaaS application to answer phones will become an organizational liability if the, if the SLA for performance is not met. And remember that most SLAs only cover uptime, but what about performance? If the application or network is slow, it might as well be down in terms of the way it impacts an organization. Recent research from EMA found that nearly one third of enterprises surveyed have experienced an SLA breach on their WAN in the past year. But here's the real kicker. Only a little more than half of the enterprise IT WAN managers are actively monitoring SLA compliance. Think about that for a minute. That means that SLA breaches are happening and no one is seeing it about 50% of the time. And again, this is an area where IT and network ops teams can add business value to an organization in the era of cloud. Are individual business units prepared to monitor at the SLA of ISPs and cloud providers? Most likely they aren't even thinking about it. And that's an opportunity for IT. And you have to remember other important details as well, because you're not just managing the, uh, you're not just managing the, the SaaS applications. There's, there's also, you need to worry about MPLS connections and other legacy circuits. You need to worry about specific problem areas or applications. For instance, let's imagine that you've got a backup that kicks off while your CEO is, is on a, a, a VoIP call or is on a, a video conference. Chances are that's gonna impact that performance. Another thing to really consider is shadow IT. So we all talk about it, but it gets much worse when you get to a large number of remote locations. Why? Because it's as simple as putting a credit card down to bring a new application into the enterprise. And they're not gonna tell you about it. And so it's gonna be really important for you to have a way of figuring out all the applications that are running at your organization. The final thing is recreational app use. Um, you know, voice and video, um, Facebook, all of these can impact your network. Um, one story that I like to tell is uh, an organization that said that they couldn't be impacted by the World Cup because they didn't 
have any soccer fans at their organization. Um, we found out, or we helped them find out that that was wrong. And I just have one question at this oh. point. Um, Damian, when you're talking about monitoring a large number of locations, what exactly do you mean by that? Okay, so, so there's two ways I think about it. Um, the first way is that you could have a smaller number of locations, say 25 or less, but you have a large number of users accessing business critical applications. Um, an example of that might be a, dis a distributed set of call centers where you've got a large number of people that are all dependent on that network connectivity, not just for voice, but also for all the applications that they're using to manage customers there. But then you've got these widely distributed organizations that may have, you know, thousands of locations. Um, and, you know, in the in those cases, those are probably the most extreme cases that we see. Um, so in that second case where you've got a smaller number of users, again, accessing business critical applications, I still think, you know, that once that number gets to above 100, you're, you're into a lot of management, potential management pain. But thanks for the question. Um, so last point here is, you know, IT is entering a, a brave new world when it comes to monitoring these remote locations. And so to help with this, um, we've come up with a, a bunch of best practices that we hope will help you in, in managing remote locations going forward. And with that, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Alec to drill in more on these. Great. Thanks, Damon. Uh, before we get into the best practices, I'm going to bring back the earlier graphic that uh, Damien used to talk about two things, uh, the network and the data that you can get from it. So the first question I want to ask to kind of frame this is to look at which networks are in your domain and which of this, which of these do you want to or more likely have to monitor and manage in order to be successful. Uh, the issue of monitoring is often an issue of ownership, right? Uh, historically, we've had great visibility into our local networks through our own infrastructure monitoring, but now with the use of data centers, hybrid cloud, or SaaS apps, we've lost a lot of that detail. So your spheres of influence likely include the, the local networks at each office, as well as the wide area network that connects them, which increasingly have optimization tools on top of it, like SD-WAN, uh, security through VPN tunnels, uh, delivery via MPLS, uh, and at office locations, you have the ever important Wi-Fi networks. So your goal for remote location monitoring, be it an office site or a retail store, uh, should be end-to-end -end network visibility. Uh, the reasoning being that you can solve issues faster if you have the, the bigger picture in mind. Uh, so each network component will also have hooks to the outside world that affect the performance on the network. Uh, most often this involves a number of ISPs, including the SLAs you have with them, uh, or potentially SLAs you have within SD-WAN vendor as well. Um, so, okay, uh, focusing on the goal of end-to-end -end network visibility, let's look at the data side of network monitoring before we get into the best practices. Uh, so I'm assuming you have some ability to see into your separate remote offices today uh, in some form, uh, although the, that visibility typically doesn't include end user experience or it isn't a complete end user experience picture. So using NetFlow records or SNMP data uh, can give a, a basically a basic view into the infrastructure, but if you're relying on that to troubleshoot issues, the question becomes how far back are you able to see uh, and at what granularity? So when you get a ticket, isolating a problem to see first if it's in your area in, of influence is a good first step, uh, but you need to find out if it's a recurring issue or exists only at a point in time, as Damien mentioned earlier. So complaints from users are often hazy on the details, so uh, to identify the start time of the problem, uh, it's helpful to have the historical data to prove any theories you might have or to kind of uncover additional context that you might not expect like a congestion point from a rogue backup routine, YouTube traffic, or a Google Drive sync. And I'll actually go into that a little bit later with an example. But to get to the root cause of an issue, you need to be able to see what happened, hopefully back when it was happening, and ideally with an associated packet capture during the event uh, so that you can take the next step and analyze the traffic further. Uh, this, this extra granularity gets you to the root cause of the problem, but it's rarely an option without rolling a truck or uh, hopping in a time machine. So your monitoring system should be able to do this, uh, but there's no need to actually be present at the remote sites in kind of our modern distributed world, as Damien was describing. Um, so setting up active tests of the user experience at various remote locations 
even just several geographically distributed monitoring points will give you a ton of data to understand what users are seeing uh, in their applications. And once you start to have a bank of data on your remote users and related networks, uh, you can see those trends over time and develop a, a baseline for performance uh, to use at other locations, uh, especially when you're setting up new ones. Okay, so down to business. Uh, our, our first best practice uh, is to set up a plan for new locations at scale. Uh, so scale is something we always want to be prepare, prepared for. Uh, you have to make sure that you have the processes in place for new employees, uh, new offices, uh, or new application traffic. Most of us have prepared for extra capacity on our networks through resource allocation or have a, a plan around hardware for new employees. But what about the applications? Uh, are we planning for more data intensive applications in the future? Or are you creating benchmarks for capacity over time to see the trends? Uh, when we talk about new employees, your process probably already includes app provisioning uh, for your core apps like G Suite or Workday. But based on those apps and any others that you can identify, uh, see if you can build out a capacity estimation for each user. Uh, you know, unless this is the first member of a new team, it should be pretty easy to compare to another employee nearby on the org, org chart. Uh, if your IT department owns any of the apps uh, that they will be using, uh, you should also include a cost per head estimate, estimation uh, on the subscription costs for that user. Uh, and make sure to stray away from solutions that require additional client-side apps uh, that have to be run on every user device, uh, as these can be kind of a nightmare to manage and maintain. For new offices, uh, we jump from single connections uh, to many connections. So you're already, uh, you're already likely looking at the bandwidth needs based on some kind of formula for X number of people, uh, but I encourage you to include the number of high volume applications in that calculation. Uh, you can prove IT's worth to the rest of the company by creating benchmarking uh, for your remote locations, and being able to accurately plan bandwidth uh, if you have monitoring in place at similar locations or can extrapolate from uh, existing ones. Setting up uh, alerting and packet capture scheduling can help troubleshooting uh, if the new offices have limited or no IT on site, which is uh, more and more common. Uh, and finally here, we, when planning for scale, uh, consider any new application traffic that might arise in the future. Uh, some of this is going to be difficult to do, but part of this will require you to be involved in the new app discussions or making it known that you're interested in these projects, uh, even from just a consultatory basis. By knowing the types of apps your employees are considering, you can spend some time on capacity estimation, uh, estimation uh, prioritization, uh, and proactively setting alert thresholds for poor performance. Uh, either way, plan for what you don't know about, uh, ensure that monitoring will catch uh, shadow IT early, and alert you if any new apps uh, that are using significant bandwidth at these locations kind of arises. Uh, to contextualize these tips a little bit, uh, let's look at some real data from May so far. Uh, this is actually the top 20 apps sorted by uh, packet count over the last month uh, or so, it's around 23 days. Uh, from our 37-person Boston office. Uh, taking a quick look at the chart on top, we can see that there were some isolated spikes uh, back in the beginning of May uh, in the pack accounts for Google APIs. Uh, that makes sense since we're all using G Suite for email collaboration and drive backup, uh, but the spike doesn't match typical, uh, typical traffic patterns. Uh, having data for a few months back is great in this case because I can see uh, I can see these spikes even though I may have missed them. Uh, and so in order to correlate problems in the past, uh, we can actually see this data. Uh, but here I actually know that drilling in uh, with our solution, uh, that it was actually the backup of our VP of product, uh, Sean Armstrong, uh, was it basically was doing a backup when he moved his to his new laptop. And so uh, isolating the actual IP address or the Active Directory resolution here, I can see that the user was actually Sean. Um, but and Sean has been here for yep yeah eight Sean. years, so this is a, a good amount of data. Yeah, and also one of the few people who has a, a specific domain uh, or subdomain within the the original network. Um, but you can also know that there's about 50% of traffic on the backup. This is a drill down view right now is actually uh, only the internal hosts. So the external host being all of the uh, Google uh, hosts that are uh, receiving that backup and storing it. Uh, so obviously the uh, outbound traffic here is about 50%. Um, 
So let's now look at kind of the alert that we have here. It's kind of uh, glaring in our face here. Uh, we have uh, YouTube traffic over, over our threshold. Uh, on the far right, we can see the total traffic volume uh, for about uh, 80 gigabytes of YouTube traffic. Uh, which, you know, boiling it down, so 80 gigabytes divided by the 30 day or the 23 days or so, uh, and the 37 people is around uh, 92 to 94 megabytes per person per day, uh, which for uh, 720p video is roughly two videos per day. Uh, that doesn't seem too bad, but it can add up quickly. And also we're assuming here that it's an evenly distributed uh, across uh, time and employees, which uh, my guess is that that's actually rarely the case. Um, and Alec, we have a question about this slide. What, mm -hmm. How is this data actually collected? Ah, so I'll go into some of the details actually in a second, uh, or some of the other ways in a second here, but we collect this data uh, by using a mirror pipe uh, to look at a local copy of all traffic with a monitoring point that we have here in the Boston office. Uh, we run it through our deep packet inspection engine to get the application identification uh, and create a record to send to the cloud. Uh, it's stored in BigQuery and retrieve VR via our application usage solution. Uh, but we could just as easily pull that data out via Wireshark compatible packet capture, capture if that's more familiar. Um, so if you have any more questions on that, we can actually reach out after the webinar. Great, thank you. Um, great, so something else I can see here, just uh, looking at this uh, data that actually led me to go verify with engineering, uh, is I see a lot of high traffic from our own product. Uh, it's actually listed as AppNet Apathy there. Um, it's not uncommon for our offices to show a large amount of traffic due to the fact that we have a bunch of monitoring points running our demo environment. Uh, but engineering has actually confirmed that this is uh, some volume testing we're doing now around a new feature that enhances our value for virtualized networks and 10 gig networks. So uh, you can actually stay tuned for that announcement. Uh, probably in, uh, actually, I, I won't quote product dates. Uh, but, uh, all right. So. Uh, seeing the applications in use, uh, you know, once you once your plan to scale is rolling along, uh, a large portion of the job of IT is being kind of the expert on the traffic that is sent and received on your network. So identifying what applications are causing congestion or retroactively discovering the root cause of poor app performance is crucial. Uh, the traditional solution uh, to this is looking at NetFlow records or JFlow or SFlow, uh, but there are a few questions to raise that may limit your view. Uh, so if you're collecting NetFlow, are you collecting just corporate data or all of your internet traffic? Are you capturing at all your locations? Uh, how long is that data kept and are you responsible for the storage half as well? And you'll see with a lot of NetFlow solutions out there, you actually have to pay for the extra storage device as well. Um, but a failure to, do, to address any of these questions will actually jeopardize your visibility into the historical performance of that network. Uh, on top of that, NetFlow adds noticeable overhead uh, to the network, often around 5%. Uh, so due to the movement of the NetFlow records over the WAN from devices to collection to storage. Uh, and actually, as an actionable tip, uh, go back to your current monitoring strategy and uh, quantify the traffic volume for NetFlow. Uh, if your network is congested uh, and you add 5% overhead, it's going to make a bad problem even worse. Uh, so look at how much NetFlow traffic you have today uh, and check to see uh, that it's going to scale from, say, 25 locations to 100 locations. Alec, we do have another question here, which is, sure. can the data that we're showing here be pulled into tools like Splunk or other methods for data parsing? Yeah, so we actually have a, an extensive API that allows you to take uh, any of these records in. Uh, our, our, basically, our records, uh, we basically synthetically create a NetFlow v9 record uh, in the back end, so you can actually take that and ingest it in another platform. Uh, but you can also access uh, any of the data just straight through the API. So there are actually a couple different ways you can do it. Um, but uh, it's definitely one of the things that we want to make sure that our data is available outside uh, of our platform. And that extends even to uh, a number of our delivery charts that can be taken and embedded uh, in either dashboarding tools or any other third party tool. Um, cool. Uh, so uh, just getting back to the NetFlow a little bit is uh, NetFlow is actually particularly bad at application identification. Uh, it's something that we take pride here in at AppNeta, but it's an afterthought for vendors like Cisco with NBAR2, uh, and that means that it lacks actionable information. Uh, you can't actually get more intelligence from the data because it's limited to begin with, uh, and a lot of the tools that use NetFlow entirely or specifically only take NetFlow data from Cisco routers, uh, they're all limited from the same data set. Uh, so application identification is not a focus for the hardware vendors like Cisco uh, because it actually increases the overhead of the NetFlow collection. 
Uh, so if you want to add user identification on top of it, uh, you can't go much beyond matching IPs. Uh, and you heard Damien mention ghost issues earlier, and that's one of the types of problems that, that you need to solve on a week-to-week -week or even a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but in general, knowing the applications and being able to quickly identify each of them, uh, even if it's the first time you're seeing them, as in the case of Shadow IT, uh, this is a, it's super important when troubleshooting. Uh, so we recommend categorizing traffic in any way that you can. Uh, enabling alerts for categories is infinitely easier than trying to alert on every app as you find it. Uh, an alert that notifies you if, you know, say, 6 to 7% of network traffic is social media traffic is just miles better than targeting something specific like Snapchat or Instagram uh, because those apps are going to change over time. And finally, when it comes to the prioritization, uh, we have to talk about voice over IP and video conferencing. Uh, you may not uh, or you may need to not only ensure good quality uh, with a metric like QoS, uh, but you, if you've also purchased SD-WAN, you can route business critical traffic to a higher capacity link or a dedicated link, uh, while recreational traffic can be uh, relegated to a lower capacity link. Uh, what we recommend is to ensure that QoS monitoring uh, makes it on the list of metrics you track, because we see ISPs routinely demote DHCP values to best effort, uh, and, you know, instead of expedited forwarding. Uh, often it's not your main ISP, but it's a peer uh, that, do, that basically does it once the peering relationship uh, comes into play. Uh, and uh, we'll also throw in a vote for uh, monitoring the SLA violations with your ISP to make sure that you can hold them accountable of not only themselves, but the people they're peering with. All right, uh, we've talked about the network architecture uh, and the data, uh, but in the context of the network and the application. So you need to have methodologies or practices that you can employ uh, to separate network and app issues when you're troubleshooting. Uh, with remote locations, you often lack that on-site on IT resource. Uh, and I mentioned earlier how uh, kind of you can use uh, packet captures uh, to, to your benefit, but you can also use remote packet captures, you know, when you're not on-site. Uh, remote packet captures are going to be extremely helpful here. Uh, but the main problem with answering complaints and closing tickets is kind of quickly identifying the root cause of the issue. Uh, and here, as I mentioned, app identification is key. Uh, but we, what you really need is a holistic picture of the local network, the WAN, the SaaS provider network, uh, and the application response itself. So what I'm suggesting is ensuring that you have some visibility into the application delivery path with an emphasis on seeing the handoff points at least between your app, the network, and the client or the user. Uh, relying on just SNMP data for local networks or BGP data for the internet uh, doesn't actually provide this value because you're looking at the whole network or the whole internet uh, when you're trying to troubleshoot one connection. Uh, so being able to boil down your network to this one connection quickly uh, is really the most important aspect of separating out network and app issues. Uh, so what am I, what am I suggesting? Uh, monitoring performance on multiple fronts, uh, monitoring the apps that are being used on the network, monitor the network path between the users and apps, and then monitor the apps themselves. Uh, in the troubleshooting process, you need to be able to rule out certain portions of the app delivery process to narrow your focus. Uh, if I hear Salesforce is slow, I need to know where the user is uh, to identify congestion on the local network or the Wi-Fi network. Maybe colleagues are streaming the World Cup, like Damian mentioned earlier. Uh, if not uh, the local network, then I need to look at the WAN to see if there is an issue with capacity, loss, or excessive latency on that connection. If I can't find anything there, then I need to isolate the hops in the network path that are in Salesforce's domain uh, and, and basically check uh, synthetic performance against the Salesforce app to see if it's in their network or with the actual app itself. Um, big SaaS apps are load balancing requests behind their firewall, but if I can see the hops uh, within their firewall, then I can identify the problem. Uh, is at least in their infrastructure. So for your business critical apps, you need all of these monitoring inputs to be able to decide very quickly if it's an issue you can fix or an issue you need to raise with a third party, be it an ISP, SD-WAN vendor, or a SaaS provider. But uh, as another note here, what happens if you're the one delivering a service uh, to a remote location? So what if you are the vendor yourself? Uh, if you're responsible for the quality of that service, then you'll need to monitor and alert on SLA thresholds. Uh, these are the ones that you set with your customers, regardless of whether they're internal or external. Uh, using global points of presence, you can simulate connections from all over uh, to identify localized WAN issues and narrow the scope of your search. 
Uh, troubleshooting the problems of owned applications uh, mandates the ability to separate the network and app issues because uh, there's actually money on the line, right? If you can't fix it or uh, prove that you're uh, innocent of the uh, of the performance crime, uh, you know, on an issue, then uh, it's your company that's on the hook. So uh, to wrap up uh, my portion a little bit, all these tips uh, or kind of best practices are best done in concert with each other. Uh, planning for scale, identifying and prioritizing apps, and ensuring fast troubleshooting with visibility into both the network and app performance are key for modern monitoring. Uh, this being an AppNeta web webinar, I'll pass it back to Damien and uh, tell you how we can help. Damien? Yeah, not, su not surprisingly, all the things that Alec described there are things that are part of our platform called the AppNeta Performance Manager. So we divide it into three key chunks, and I'm going to move quickly here because we're, uh, we're running a little over. So the first thing is usage. Um, so understanding all the applications that are deployed in a given remote location or in any location inside your organization and understanding how those applications affect each other uh, is, is critical. Also understanding at the user level is critical. The second portion is, okay, now that I understand, um, now that I understand what applications are running, I want to actively monitor them. So rather than, you know, just looking at the usage, let's actually go out and send traffic to these services to simulate transactions and make sure that both the application and the network are up. And that's really the two components of experience and delivery experience being, uh, sending synthetic web transactions, so walking through websites, doing doing transactions as if a user was was running it, and then delivery is active network testing, so that we can actually see what's happening on the network. Um, it was asked earlier, you know, how do we get this data? And uh, the the way we get this data is that we put uh, monitoring points in key, uh, key places, key network egresses where your users are accessing business critical applications. And that could be physical devices that are deployed at your large offices, smaller devices that are deployed at remote sites, or cloud-based agents that, uh, that, that live in, in um, environments like AWS and Azure. Um, the key thing about this is that they all report data back to our central cloud service, uh, which can be either uh, public or private. So if you've got higher security concerns, just be aware we've got a private cloud solution. I want to drill in just a little bit on what, what we can see with these things. So the first thing I'm showing here is some, some screenshots from our usage application. So the first thing we're seeing here is that we can identify the applications and bandwidth usage by individual locations. We're just showing a small slice here across our three offices in Boston, San Francisco, and Vancouver. We can also break those applications down by category, so we can easily separate recreational traffic from business critical traffic. And if we want to drill into a specific location like Alec was showing earlier, we can, we can do that and see all of the applications that are running here. And if necessary, we can do things like automatically uh, run a packet capture if we notice a problem that is there or schedule a packet capture. And uh, finally, we can, oh, can you go back one? So uh, we can see application usage and end user experience by the individual user. And if you have Active Directory, we can also resolve this back to the actual name of the person. And uh, we can, as Alec was talking about, you know, we think that QoS is incredibly important. I'm sure you guys do as well. Being able to, to see QoS, um, end-to-end -end is, is one of the other key values that we can bring with usage. Switching to the experience side here, what we're showing here is a breakdown of application, network, and browser time. So this is running through, um, logging into, I believe in this case, yes, we're accessing Salesforce from our Vancouver office and um, you know, seeing, that, seeing what that experience is like with Salesforce from that specific location. You know, you can run synthetic from global points of presence, but as I mentioned, we think it's incredibly important to monitor from behind the firewall where your actual users are, because that actually represents their experience as opposed to a global point of presence, which might be hitting on different infrastructure. Um, 
our VP of product has a great saying about this. He, he likes to say that performance is a location specific problem. And I think this highlights that. We can also compare different points, right? So this is showing accessing a Salesforce from four different locations, from our four different offices here, Boston, Vancouver, and seeing the different performance. And that performance can be broken down by overall performance, but also on what we call a milestone basis. So actually logging in and performing a series of transactions. We have um, one question for you, Damien. Yeah. How do you get end-to-end -end QoS info without NetFlow or similar? So we'll hold that question for one second because I want to show a, a screen on, on, on QoS. Perfect. And next screen. And so one of the things that makes us sort of the secret sauce here at Abnet is a technology called TruePath, which allows um, hop by hop network analysis over any network. So what we're doing in this case is we're sending out small bursts of packets and then looking at the, the results from coming back from that. Um, and this is what this technology enables, for instance, one of the things to answer the, the, the question is it allows us to see things like uh, latency, or basically any network stat that you can think of on a hop by hop basis. And one of those things is QoS. Um, when we detect a problem, we automatically drop into a diagnostic mode uh, which is also unique to Appnetta. So we're not only sort of finding the problem, but then we automatically kick off a diagnostic that tells you what the problem is. And Alec, if you go to the next screen, you'll see that one of the things that we can see here is this is the result of one of our one of our um, one of our diagnostic tests. One of the things we can see here is we can see QoS and what's happening to QoS as it passes along the path. Um, there's a lot more to this. It's very tough for me to get into all the details of measuring QS and honestly to get into all the aspects of TruePath. Um, but if you're interested in that, please reach out to me and I'm happy to walk through. Also on the website, there's a long white paper, probably too long, mm -hmm. on, on TruePath that can walk you through all the details. Now we're, we're over time here by eight minutes, which is... Uh, is all is against you know what I try and do here, but I, I do see looks like we might have some questions, so I'll, I'll we'll try and take one or two. Um, so yeah, one question is whether TruePath adds network overhead. Ah, great question. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're used to traditional methods of measuring capacity or looking at at, at, um, at testing networks, the tr the traditional technique is to use flooding, and flooding is great except uh, in, in that it's accurate, but you can't run it all the time because if you did, you, no, no other traffic would be able to get through. Uh, TruePath uses extremely small packet sizes. And the, the benefit of that is we can run, therefore run continuously. So we're talking about bursts of 20 to 50 packets that where we're running tests um, about every, uh, w once a minute. And that can give us the continuous view. Yes, yeah, so we're actually only taking up about five milliseconds every minute. Uh, for our testing, uh, but as David mentioned, we'll auto escalate for uh, confirming issues and running diagnostics. Um, but we, we welcome you to test our theories. We have very accurate data and we can test it against uh, a flooding tool, uh, either our own or one that you're using. And you'll see that we're, you know, I think roughly 98 to 99% accurate. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So we, let's wrap up. That was, um, Okay. That was, that was great. That All right. Was, yeah. Well, we're, we're like I said, we're 10 minutes over. I, if you're interested in trying this for yourself, we actually have an interactive demo. You can go sign up and you'll be brought into the a demo version of the AppNeta Performance Manager where you can play around and experience all this and actually, um, you know, uh, see some of this data for yourself. So I'd encourage you to do that. And it, also, if you're interested in getting a trial, we do do trials of our of our solution. So please reach out to us. And uh, that's it. Alec, thank you very much. Christine, thank you, thank you very much. And I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Bye now.